Hi, you're watching Nursing A. Today we're going to talk about postpartum care of the neonate. The neonate is from birth to 28 days of age. At 29 days of age, we refer to babies as infants up until one year. The goals of neonatal nursing care include the maintenance of body heat and respiratory function, decreasing the risk of infection, teaching parents and supporting them in topics such as nutrition, hydration, and care of self and baby. Some other terms related to the neonate. We talk about gestational age. Preterm can be divided into very premature, so be born before 32 weeks, premature, born between 32 and 34 weeks, or really 33 weeks and six days, or late premature, born between 34 weeks and 36 weeks and six days. The full term neonate was born between 37 and 40 weeks, and even up to 41, and then the post-term neonate or post-mature occurred after 41 weeks of gestation. So when we're talking about gestational age, we're talking about how far along they were um, developmentally in terms of age weeks of gestation. Size though has another set of uh, indicators. So we have size related to gestational age and AGA is appropriate for gestational age. So that's a baby who's a normal size for that gestational age. So you might have a baby who weighs, you know, four pounds, but is born prematurely, and that's appropriate for that gestational age, versus if you had a full term baby, that would be small for that gestational age. So LGA is large for gestational age. And for full term babies, those are macrosomia babies that weigh between um, you know, 4,000 to 4,500 grams or more. So that would be 8.8 .8 to 9 pounds or greater. And then small for gestational age are uh, babies that have a low birth weight, so less than 2,500 grams, which is about five and a half pounds. Very low birth weight would be less than 1,500 grams, which is about 3.3 uh, pounds, and extremely low birth weight would be less than 1,000 grams, which is 2.2 pounds, and that obviously is an extremely little baby. When the child is born, if it's born vaginally, the chest is compressed during the delivery process which squeezes about 30 milliliters of amniotic fluid from the lungs. At the same time, the compression of the thorax creates a vacuum so that when it's released, air gets sucked in, and this is called a passive breath, and it stimulates breathing and crying. The cord stops pulsating after delivery, and so there's no maternal or placental blood flow, which causes a decrease in oxygenation and an increase in CO2 and therefore acidosis. So babies breathe by a normal hypercarbic drive. So as their CO2 levels increase, it stimulates respirations. And then these respirations, both from the delivery itself and then from the kind of oxygenation and acid base challenge changes, cause changes in pulmonary vessel pressure and volume. So the foramen ovale closes, the ductus venosus closes after um, there's a loss of flow and then you know we clamp the cord. And then the ductus arteriosus closes. And you know we do our APGARs at one minute, five minutes because we want to give the baby time to transition from that fetal to kind of normal circulation so typically you know the cord stops pulsating by about a minute and the baby has started breathing and some of those changes are occurring and we'll start to see kind of a, a normal um, post uh, delivery blood flow the neonate is at risk for something called cold stress and they try very hard 
to maintain temperature through activity and vascular constriction and brown fat metabolism or non-shivering thermogenesis. But this puts preemies at a huge risk for hypothermia or cold stress because they don't have brown fat and they're unable to shiver. So it's really critical that we prevent cold stress. And we do this by things like keeping the head covered because the head has a large surface area and heat is lost rapidly um, by evaporation. We prevent drafts to avoid heat loss by convection. We don't place the infant on a cold surface to prevent heat loss by conduction. And we don't place them uh, near a window or any sort of like breeze to prevent heat loss uh, by radiation. Keep them covered at all times, only expose small areas for like diapering or, you know, undress them briefly to like change them and then redress them again. Again, they only have a very small amount of that subcutaneous fat to conserve body heat and they'll run out of those glucose stores very quickly and keep the infant dry to prevent that heat loss by evaporation. So one of the ways that I like to remember this is kind of the do what probably seems simple, D-W-P-S-S. -S. Dry the baby off thoroughly, keep them warm by covering the head and wrapping them up, position them skin to skin uh, with mom for a minimum of one to two hours, cover them both with warm blankets. And um, then, you know, we only do like, you know, stimulation and suction if needed, but the dry, warm and position is probably one of the most important things that we do to prevent heat stress in these little kids. So if you start to recognize cold stress, you have to ask yourself, are they dry? You know, d did they have a blowout in their diaper or they, did they urinate through their diaper? Are they wet? Um, you know, did I dry them well enough? Is their head covered or did somebody uncover their head to check out their cute little hair and forget to put it back on? Are they really swaddled or are they, you know, um, good skin to skin contact? So you know, make sure that, you know, they're using that active warming by another human being. And then if they can't maintain their own temperature, we want to preheat a warmer and then get them naked underneath the warmer so that they have active warming. Monitor their temperature really carefully. Check a glucose and treat hypoglycemia. So hypothermia and hypoglycemia go hand in hand. And what happens when the baby gets cold is that they start getting active in order to try to keep themselves warm. And so this means that they use up more oxygen and they start then to get actually hypoxic. So there's not enough oxygen to go around and they can start to get acidotic. And they also use up their glucose stores. And so they'll start then to release lactic acidosis and they'll get hypoglycemic. And when the baby gets stressed like this, they actually stop making as much surfactant and the alveoli start to collapse, which will not only put them into respiratory stress, but can actually reopen the fetal circulation. So the foraminal valley and the ductus arteriosus can reopen, causing those bypasses and decreasing oxygenation and perfusion even more. And so this is kind of this terrible kind of catch 22 downward spiral that they get into. So if you do notice that the baby is cold and seems to be like, you know, they, they can't shiver, but they do seem kind of jittery, then check their glucose. And if it's less than 40, feed them dextrose water or formula or glucose gel, or if they have an IV, give them um, D5 or D10. Um, and, you know, really, it's, it's important that we treat them, right? So they need to be fed. And I kind of can't stress this enough that kids cannot get cold and they cannot go without being fed. The neonate is at risk for infection related to a poor immune system. So we use erythromycin eye ointment to protect from eye infections from gonorrhea and chlamydia that could have been present in the vaginal canal. And you use about a quarter inch bead on the lower lid and it will get goopy 
but you know they don't have great eyesight at this point in time anyway and you don't want them to go blind so a small amount of blurry vision is a little trade-off um, for a lifetime of blindness the neonate is also at risk for bleeding related to an immature liver function and um, poor vitamin k synthesis so we give them intramuscular vitamin k injections uh, so just one an injection and uh, it's important that you use a small little needle so like a 25 gauge needle because we don't want to give them a big needle you wouldn't want to use like a 21 gauge needle it's so big it would actually make them bleed so you want to use a very small needle and only 5 8 inches all you need for an IM injection on a neonate Routine care for neonates includes things like axillary temps, monitoring the vital signs, which would be an apical pulse, a respiratory rate where you're looking at the um, abdomen moving and the chest moving. Uh, we don't really do blood pressures. Uh, they do have to have a blood pressure usually on their right arm and left leg prior to discharge. And we don't really do O2 sets because we know that they're going to be low initially until they really get a good handle on their vasomotor control of their blood vessels. Monitor intake and output. So time on the breast or ounces fed versus the um, number of wet diapers. And then we want to monitor stool and the number of stools that they have and the characteristics. So we're looking to see it go from meconium, which is thick, dark, dark green, almost black looking, um, to a transitional stool where if they are um, breastfed, it will start to look like a mustard yellow kind of seedy um, appearance. And if they are bottle fed, um, it will just get like a lighter green and then start to turn yellow and um, kind of look like, you know, baby poop. And then main, maintain a neutral thermal environment and, and again, very critical, making sure that the baby isn't near windows or drafts or wet surfaces or fans and, and keep the baby in just kind of a neutral, warm environment, not too hot, not too cold, kind of like Goldilocks. <laughs> um, we want to perform our neonatal assessment and document our findings, and this includes uh, reflexes and a maturational assessment as well. So we really do a good job, especially initially. I want you to think of this as like an admission assessment where you have to do a really thorough head to toe exam to initially identify anything that's potentially a problem and make sure that you know anything that could be considered outside of the normal is well documented and then tracked and monitored. So we want normal assessments. Normal assessment findings would include things like a flexed posture, uh, pink skin with some acrocyanosis, so it's not abnormal to see some um, blue around like the mouth, the nose, even the eyeballs, um, and that can just kind of come and go. The fontanelles should be flat. They shouldn't be sunken or bulging. The outer canthus of the eye should line up with the top of the pinna of the ear, so you're looking to see if there's any kind of like low set uh, ears. Um, initially with the lungs, it's normal to hear scattered crackles because there's still amniotic fluid in the lungs. And the respirations will be irregular and kind of patterned because the baby hasn't learned to breathe yet in a normal pattern. So the baby is just breathing with that hypercarbic drive. And so it's just breathing as the CO2 level gets elevated. The heart rate should be between 110 and 160. It could go down into the 90s when the baby is sleeping and it could go up into the 180s when the baby is very active and moving and awake but at rest and just you know alert and looking around. It should be 110 to 160 resting, and it should be regular. Now, sometimes it, it speeds up slightly and slows down slightly with breathing, but we would still consider that regular. What you shouldn't have is a baby who's an AFib. It's not normal to have like a really irregular heart rhythm um, in a newborn. The abdomen should be soft and round and you should look at the cord and initially the cord is kind of thick and yellowy white um, and there's um, three vessels in the cord, two arteries and one vein, and then there's Wharton's jelly that fills the cord uh, itself and kind of gives it its structure. And then um, after we've kind of looked at the front, we want to roll the baby over gently onto its belly, so into a prone position. And we also want to look at um, the back. So the spine, the gluteal folds, 
the sacrum, looking for any evidence of spina bifida, looking for any evidence of hip dysplasia. Um, the rectum and the urinary tract, we determine patency by stooling and urination. We don't do rectal temps anymore to check to make sure that the anus is patent. Um, if the baby doesn't have its first meconium stool within 48 hours, then that is reportable. And if it does not urinate within 24 hours, then that also is reportable. You should be familiar with normal color variances and uh, birthmarks for children as well. And those should all be documented, um, you know, just so that you can track them and follow them and make sure that either they're resolving or that they were documented as a normal finding for the neonate in case questions ever arise. And we know that um, uh, certain uh, especially biracial children will have Mongolian spots that people will mistake for um, injury or abuse later on. So it's very helpful to have those documented when they are young. Reflexes are checked. Um, <clears throat> we look at the Moro or the startle reflex. We look at rooting and sucking reflexes. Um, we look at the little fencing, the neck uh, tonic reflex. Um, we look at finger grasps. We look at toe grasps, so palmar and plantar grasps, and then Babinski's. Um, it, the stepping reflex also exists. So it's important just to kind of understand those normal reflexes and what the neonate should do in response to your stimulation or assessment. Danger signs that you would need to report include signs of respiratory distress. It is not normal for a child to have a respiratory rate greater than 60 or a heart rate greater than 180. They should not be using accessory muscles to breathe. You should not see retractions in between the ribs. There should not be nasal flaring where they look like their nares are wide open trying to get lots of air and there should not be persistent grunting. So if you're taking care of a little kid and they're going <coughs> with every breath, that should make you super scared. And on top of that, they might have some strider or some wheezes or something else going on, and they can sound absolutely terrible. If listening to your child breathe gives you goosebumps, there is something wrong with them. Cyanosis, pallor, those are very bad findings. And hypotonia is that limp, flaccid, like wet dish rag baby, never normal. So those are things that you should recognize right away. And you need to, if you know there's an airway problem, you're going to open it. And if there's a breathing problem, you're going to support breathing and give oxygen. If there's a circulation problem, you're going to stop bleeding, do CPR if needed, and call for help immediately, right? So always think about, like, is there something I can do to help this or fix this? And once I've maxed that out, I need to call for help. Cold stress, again, temperature less than 97.7, pale, cool skin, lethargy, hypotonia, a weak suck. So I didn't mention this, but one of the things that happens when kids get cold and their blood glucose gets low is that they can't eat. They get super weak and they are like really terrible at feeding. And so what do they need? They need to feed, but they can't feed because they're so weak. And so then we end up having to like drip in some glucose water or even put in um, an OG tube and feed them or IV. Glucose is fine too. Tachypnea, grunting, hypoglycemia, and jitteriness are all signs of cold stress. Again, recognize them and make sure you report them um, once you have checked a glucose a temperature and treated what you can treat based on your protocols and standing orders. And then other signs and symptoms that you would want to document and report would be things like abdominal distension, if there was no uh, max stool in 48 hours or no urine output in 24 hours, or if you start to see jaundice in under 24 hours because that's pathologic. Oftentimes when you're caring for babies in the hospital, they get circumcised before they get discharged. And one of the frequent questions is how do we manage pain? So if uh, you know when the circumcision is going to happen, you can do Tylenol one hour before, and then they get dosed every um, six hours. <laughs> of four times a day afterwards uh, for 24 hours, 
I had to do the math in my head. Um, sucrose and uh, non-nutritive sucking have been shown to be phenomenal at pain management. So you want to start two minutes before and you can just dip the pacifier or your gloved finger in the sugar water and um, start two minutes ahead of time where they can just kind of suck on your finger um, and that calms them remarkably and it, you need to repeat that about every five to seven minutes giving them another dose uh, but it's amazing how well um, sucrose and uh, you know sucking on a finger or pacifier will help calm a baby and a lot of them don't cry at all during circumcision if they have that sucrose even if they haven't had Tylenol already and then wound care for the circumcision includes Vaseline gauze to keep the diaper from sticking to the um, site itself to the wound and then monitoring for bleeding or infection and um, if they use xeriform gauze and wrap it around the penis you want to make sure that it doesn't turn into a tourniquet so a lot of places will just kind of put um, like two by twos on each side with like some bacitracin or some Vaseline neonatal abstinence syndrome is something we start monitoring for as soon as we identify a mother who's high risk but also just in all babies and this occurs when the mother um, had used uh, typically an opioid during pregnancy um, and it also includes uh, moms who had used uh, substitution therapy during pregnancy so this is referred to as NAS NAS and these babies typically present with uh, problems with consolability so crying sucking frantic kind of sucking hyperreflexia, and they get to the point where they're so discoordinated that they can't eat um, so they do like tongue thrusting instead of bringing the food backward they accidentally spit it out um, they're irritable restless they oftentimes get very congested nasally and sneeze a lot they yawn a lot and then just these like constant kind of tremors mm -hmm. uh, and overall poor feeding we like to teach the parents or whoever's taking them home the five S's of NAS care and that includes swaddling your baby so typically we say for neonates you just need to keep them warm and only swaddle them like you know when you're holding them but don't swaddle them for sleep for NAS babies they need to be swaddled so they need that swaddling for that comfort so that they can calm then you should be um, in a side stomach position as much as possible sometimes that really helps them kind of calm down um, so not face down but just not they don't go in that back to sleep position so these are very different things than what we do for the standard neonate um, we shush them or sh 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 they tend to respond well to that sound and then um, swinging or swaying and where a normal neonate likes that very slow kind of gentle rocking the NAS baby needs kind of a faster shorter type of uh, bounce or wiggle and then sucking and non-nutritive sucking is huge um, but these babies tend to have a hard time um, when they don't have something in their mouth to suck on so oftentimes they need like a constant pacifier or something at first this can go on for weeks so it's important that we recognize that withdrawal is a painful process both physically and mentally and we need to do everything that we can to comfort and reassure these neonates during this difficult transition um, group B strep or um, group B streptococcus infection is a colonized bacteria that lives in the vagina and the rectum of a large percentage of women and it does not cause an active infection in the mother but it can cause an active infection in the neonate during delivery so pregnant women are usually screened between 35 and 37 weeks but it takes a couple of days for the culture to come back so if you know mom's water breaks at 34 weeks and she hasn't been screened or even at 35 or 36 weeks and she hasn't been screened yet then we're not going to know prior to delivery probably whether or not she was positive so if somebody is screened and they are positive they get treated with 
prophylactic antibiotics, usually penicillin, during the um, labor phase. And so if they're treated, then that's the kind of the lowest risk and the, they need to stay for at least 24 hours of observation to make sure that there are no signs or symptoms of infection. If they're not treated, so if they're not screened or if they're not treated, um, then they need to stay for a minimum of 48 hours. So these are people we're gonna hang on to a little bit longer so that we can make sure that there's no signs or symptoms. So the reason for this is, in utero, it can cause chorioamnionitis, right? So if the uh, water breaks and it is clearly infected, then we think, okay, this baby probably has group B strep, and that's really concerning. But if the you know amniotic fluid is clear and mom is still positive, the baby can still pick up the infection on the way out, and it can get into the bloodstream. And if it goes to the brain, it can cause meningitis, and it's you know it can be fatal. And if it goes to other places in the body, it can cause septicemia and widespread organ failure and can also be fatal. So what we're monitoring for is fever, grunting, so any sort of respiratory distress, tachypnea, tachycardia, so evidence of infection or shock, petechiae that starts out as like little pink dots and then becomes this kind of confluent purpuric rash and then like pustules or vesicles so you're looking for any evidence of like infection on the skin pulmonary infection um, you know any sort of evidence of um, infection at all so you're looking at the vital signs you're looking at the skin you're listening to the lungs so these little kids get monitored for 48 hours. Um, it does require some teaching for mom as well, just to make sure, or dad, you know, whoever, to make sure that they understand um, the risks and what to watch for at home. So in case things change after discharge, it is one of the primary causes of like meningitis and sepsis in the first two weeks after delivery. Newborn screenings then, once the baby's born, we screen for a bunch of things. So um, different states have different rules about what they have to be screened for prior to discharge. Um, some of the things that they're screened for include um, metabolic disorders. And uh, one of those is phenylketonuria or PKU. And uh, PKU is something that's concerning for us. Uh, because the baby is unable to metabolize phenylalanine, which is an amino acid that's present in breast milk. And this results then in an accumulation of metabolites that can result in brain damage and death. You can't test for this until after feeding is established. So usually in about two to five days after feeding is established, but most people are discharged within 24 hours, which means that we really um, need to test them after discharge. So we typically test them at 24 hours before discharge and then have them come back in again at like day three or four to test them a second time just to make sure. The blood is drawn by heel stick and if you're not familiar with the heel stick you should warm the heel for about 10 minutes with a moist cloth to get nice dilated blood vessels and great blood flow and then you always want to use the lateral aspects of the heel to avoid the nerves that run down the base of the foot. So very similar to like when you're doing a finger stick and you use that la the uh, lateral aspect of the pad of the finger and not the pad itself. So, you know, closer up to the nail. If somebody does test positive for PKU, then they have lifelong dietary restrictions and they cannot breastfeed. So we put them on low phenylac, which is a type of formula that doesn't have uh, phenylalanine in it. And then we monitor their labs kind of for life to check their phenylalanine levels. And there are some medications that are on the market that can help, um, you know, decrease or, or make uh, the patient more able to tolerate um, normal foods. And that would be Qvan, which is an oral medication, and Palinzeek, which is an injection. We also screen babies for jaundice. So if jaundice occurs within the first 24 hours of life, we call it pathologic jaundice. And if it occurs after that point, it's considered physiologic jaundice. 
This occurs as uh, from a buildup of bilirubin and usually from a breakdown of red blood cells. So um, where in an adult, when we see jaundice, we usually think like, oh, they must have liver failure. In a newborn, the liver's immature and just can't break down all of the bilirubin that's filled, you know, kind of flowing through the blood. Um, so instead they get jaundice because of a, a buildup of bilirubin in the blood because of an immature liver. Risk factors for developing hyperbilirubinemia or jaundice include um, hypoxia, breastfeeding, ABORH incompatibility. So if they have that um, immune incompatibility where mom's antibodies are attacking the fetus, that can happen. Um, oxytocin to either augment or induce the delivery. Delayed cord clamping, so the baby got kind of a transfusion of blood, which resulted then in a larger number of red blood cells that are being broken down. Poor feeding, because one of the ways that we clear bilirubin is through pooping. And then a cephalohematoma, which is uh, usually caused by vacuum uh, delivery, which causes a, a hematoma on the scalp and a collection of blood. Um, that does not cross the suture line and that hematoma then uh, all those red blood cells break down and the bilirubin is released back out into the bloodstream and makes the babies nice and yellow. Treatment for jaundice then is ABCs, safety, a neutral um, thermal environment, feeding and hydration, monitoring intake and output, and then um, phototherapy. So 18 to 20 hours a day under the billy lights or in the billy blanket. Mon um, only a diaper on with the eyes covered and uh, we um, hold for feedings. So you take them out and hold them uh, for feedings. Changing position frequently so that they don't get skin breakdown, um, you know, from being underneath the lamps. So feeding is super important. Pooping is super important. And then, um, you know, we can use the, the billy lights to help break it down as well. So let's talk about premature babies for a minute. So babies that are born prematurely have a whole other set of kind of risk or risk factors that go along with them. Um, so one of the problems that premature babies face or kind of one of the biggest problems is um, respiratory issues. Uh, so the first one that I want to talk about is called the A's and B's or apnea and bradycardia of prematurity. And uh, when the baby's brain or respiratory center is not fully developed, the baby doesn't breathe like it should in response to an increased CO2 level and the baby becomes both acidotic and hypoxic, which then causes bradycardia and cardiovascular collapse and death. So these babies are oftentimes sent home on apnea monitors. Um, so, you know, for us, we would do ABCs, a uh, neutral, uh, thermal environment, fluid and electrolyte balances, nutrition and promote breastfeeding as much as possible, and then uh, kangaroo care, so skin-to-skin -skin contact to promote early breastfeeding, temperature stabilization, and bonding with the parents. Some other respiratory uh, issues that are associated with prematurity are respiratory distress syndrome and bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So respiratory distress syndrome is when you have decreased surfactant and small alveoli that lead to atelectasis. And therefore there's a decreased oxygen uptake and a decreased CO2 release at the alveolar level, which leads to vasoconstriction and the fetal shunts remain open like a patent ductus arteriosus or that foraminal valley. And this causes uh, kind of like a persistent respiratory distress. Um, these babies tend to do really well on CPAP and some blended oxygen, uh, but if they're really struggling, they may get put on ECMO, which is like bypass and antibiotics if needed. And then um, sometimes they're also given um, surfactant as a medication to supplement their decreased surfactant levels. One of the ways that we can help prevent respiratory distress syndrome is to medicate the mother with steroids prior to preterm delivery because that stresses the baby. And when you stress the baby, the baby will make, a, and I should say when you stress the fetus, the fetus will make additional surfactant so that the lungs are more mature when they're born. 
Bronchopulmonary dysplasia, or BPD, is a chronic lung disorder that's usually due to uh, mechanical ventilation and oxygenation in those neonates that require positive pressure ventilation. And this causes drying from the oxygen um, and then pulmonary fibrosis and atelectasis, uh, which can also lead to pulmonary edema. And it's also associated with um, other problems like uh, cerebral palsy, retinopathy of prematurity, and hearing loss. So, you know, usually kids who have uh, BPD also have some other things that are going on. Um, they're usually born really young. We treat them with ABCs. We try to wean them off of pres positive pressure ventilations, and actually they've been using different types of ventilation, like high frequency um, and vibratory ventilations to um, decrease the incidence of BPD with great results. Watch for congestive heart failure, monitor intake and output, and then drugs like bronchodilators, corticosteroids, and diuretics uh, sometimes are pretty effective at managing these little patients. So this is a lifelong condition. Retinopathy of prematurity has to do with the eyes. So this is not a re uh, respiratory issue, but also is associated with prematurity. And this is where you have a hemorrhage or retinal detachment um, due to uh, eyes that aren't completely formed, like the vessels aren't completely developed. And uh, this can occur when we have like prolonged oxygenation or exposure, uh, as well as stress, um, injury, or swelling or edema that causes the, uh, retin the retina to detach or hemorrhage of those blood vessels. And um, it can end up with, um, you know, permanent or temporary vision loss. It's important to avoid bright lights in the nursery and uh, blend oxygen and titrate it um, to affect and to decrease uh, mechanical ventilation as soon as possible with all these kids. Necrotizing enterocolitis or neck is inflammation and necrosis of the bowel and we see this 90% um, of the time in preterm neonates. It has about a 30% mortality rate and usually occurs about three to 10 days after birth when enteral feeding has been established. The baby presents with acute abdominal distension and shock. So tachypnea, tachycardia, hypoxemia, and temperature instability. Bloody stools, vomiting, and lethargy may also be present. So this is a kid who has part of their bowel that has like infarcted and is now infected. Um, ABCs. NPO, OG tube to decompress the belly, so gastric decompression, IV fluids, and then this is emergency surgery with antibiotics, pain medications, and antihypertensives. Meconium aspiration syndrome is always a concern for us, and uh, we see this with um, definitely LGA babies or post-date babies, um, and uh, you know you can also get this with any child that was stressed um, in utero. And um, you know, you see here in the picture, this baby's obviously covered in meconium uh, and it's kind of stained the vernix that's covering the baby, uh, kind of this greeny yellow color. We worry about meconium staining um, when it reaches the face and if there's evidence of uh, meconium in the airway and particularly if the baby the newborn is non-vigorous and by that I mean if the APGARs are low so if the APGARs are below seven or if the baby just really it doesn't seem to be improving if they require like constant stimulation and um, you know if if uh, there's a mech below the cords um, or if there's respiratory depression or distress at the time of birth so the only thing that's really different about this is if we think that the child is having difficulty breathing because the meconium, the thick stool, has actually gotten down into the respiratory tract, the provider will intubate and suction out the lungs. So you will help set up for intubation. So as soon as you see this, you're going to prepare the room for intubation. The other thing that you need to be prepared for is 
low APGARs, right? So remember that an APGAR of 7 to 10 is great, an APGAR of like 4 to 6 is going to need additional stimulation, but an APGAR of 0 to, you know, 3, sometimes even 4, is going to need resuscitation. And so you need to prepare for resuscitation as well if things get that bad. Um, so if you come out with like a limp, blue, stained green baby that is not able to breathe and therefore the heart rate is really low, you're going to end up with, you know, a um, APGAR of two or three and you're going to end up doing CPR on this kiddo until they can get those lungs cleared out and that baby ventilating. So I just want you to be really prepared that if you see meconium, you need everything out for intubation and suction with intubation. And then in addition to that, you need your resuscitation equipment out um, because there's a high risk that, that their APGAR is going to be low enough that they're going to need interventions. So once we have delivered these beautiful babies and we have, you know, watched them for the appropriate period of time, we are going to start doing our discharge planning and teaching to prepare the parents for a successful transition to home. And teaching should always be individualized to the person that you're teaching and reflect the specific needs of the newborn and the parents. So topics to be taught include, again, nutrition, hydration, and newborn care. People should never leave the hospital without um, information about uh, abusive head trauma, so shaken baby syndrome. Uh, never shake a baby, put them down in a safe place, walk away, call someone, um, you know, don't, uh, don't leave home, but it's okay to walk away and just let them cry. You know, sometimes they'll cry for 30 to 40 minutes with no, you know, reason whatsoever. And there's nothing that you can do to fix that, but it's okay to just put them down in their crib as long as they're safe in there and just walk away so that you can kind of like calm and collect yourself. For bathing, you want to wipe off any food or dirt with a wet washcloth, use warm water, always go clean to dirty and never leave a child alone in near or with water. They should always be um, at arm's reach. And if you see a parent who has left a child, um, you know, always redirect them immediately back to that child and, you know, always reinforce the safety issue first because it's safety and then ABC. So always get them back to the safe situation. Circumcision and cord care, monitor for signs and symptoms of infection and bleeding, and report any concerns that you find. Um, for diapering, it's really important that we teach them to wipe front to back, and um, especially with uh, female babies, if the labia are really swollen, to get in there and to clean well so that there's no stool left over. And then feeding, sucking, soothing, swaddling, you know, teach them what's normal, teach them how to, um, you know, see, uh, kind of learn what their baby needs and, and how to respond uh, to that and then keep their follow-up appointments. SIDS prevention handouts should go home with people. Um, back to sleep program is really important. Um, always babies should be positioned on their back. Uh, except for our NAS babies that are oftentimes sidelining. Breastfeeding helps uh, decrease the risk of SIDS as well as using a pacifier. And then don't swaddle for sleep. So the baby should uh, be in the crib with nothing but like the little sleep sack on. They don't even recommend blankets. Um, definitely no pillows, no stuffed animals, nothing like that. No smoke exposure in the house whatsoever. No extra items in the crib. And definitely do not overheat. Breastfeeding is the optimal method of infant nutrition when possible. It decreases infections and decreases hospitalizations. It also decreases pediatric obesity. It's perfectly balanced for the needs of the growing neonate. For zero to three days, we have colostrum, which is high in protein and high in immun immunoglobulins G and A, and it helps pass the meconium stool. Transitional milk 
usually occurs from four to 10 days, which has slightly less protein, but more carbs, fats, and calories so the baby can grow. And then mature milk occurs after 10 days. And this is about 20% solids, 80% water, and has about 22 to 23 calories per ounce. The fore milk has more water and then the hind milk has more fat. So as the baby starts uh, nursing, they get more water initially, and then they get more fat as they drain the breast. Prolactin is the um, lactation hormone. So they put the lactin together and oxytocin is responsible for letdown. So prolactin develops the breast milk and oxytocin allows it to uh, release. Contraindications to breastfeeding do exist. Women who are taking certain medications or using drugs or alcohol should not breastfeed. If you're receiving chemotherapy or radioactive isotopes, we don't want to pass those on to the baby. If you have open lesions or sores on the breast, including abscesses or herpes, you should not breastfeed. And if um, you have an HIV infection, it is safe to breastfeed if you don't have access to clean water or uh, formula, then um, you know breastfeeding is preferred. If the baby has a, a metabolic disorder such as PKU or galactosemia and cannot digest breast milk, then that would also be a contraindication. Bottle feeding is considered an alternative to breast milk. It can promote bonding and allow the mother to rest while others can feed. It's digested slower and um, requires less frequent feeding, but it does take time to prepare and clean up and it does require special storage. Infants will experience growth spurts at about three to five days, one week, six weeks, three months, six months, and you'll notice that they cluster feed at about um, those times, and that you know is indicative of the fact that they're about to grow again. At four to six months, it's okay to add solids, typically one food um, at a time, so you can gauge whether or not the infant is having a reaction to those foods. Parents should be instructed to call the physician or seek medical care for a temperature above 100.4, if the baby is not feeding, if there's decreased stool or wet diapers, if the baby is lethargic, and lethargic means like super like, you know, eyes kind of at half mast, limp, they can't wake it up, you know, like if their spidey sense is tingling and they're like, wow, there's something wrong with this kid, then, you know, th that's good enough for me. Um, if you notice green watery stools, that typically means that the baby's having a hard time digesting their food. If they're vomiting, if there's a rash, if they have bulging or sunken fontanelles, that could be a sign of overhydration, dehydration, or even head injury. And if there's any signs and symptoms of infection, so cord or circumcision site infection, as well as um, if they develop a fever, tachypnea, grunting or tachycardia, all of those things would be considered danger signs and should be reported. So that's our rundown on uh, care of the newborn and the neonate. Thank you as always for watching. I hope you have a great day.